Today we're going to talk about um, beliefs, uh, the beliefs that are held by Jews, the beliefs that are held by Christians, and the beliefs that are held by Muslims. Um, what determines what goes into the belief set of the believers of the congregations of this different faith? Okay. Okay. So uh, we find that within these three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, it's it's uh, a situation where the prophets or the Messiah, the head figures um, of these religions, are no longer with us, yeah. right? Yeah. And 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 so the believers have to depend on sources to know uh, and determine what it was that the messenger was trying to tell them. Yeah. Because there's a long distance of, uh, a long uh, space of time uh, between the believers and between the prophet and the messenger, right? Yes, it's true. So, uh, how is it then that these religions have decided and who decides for the followers of these religions uh, what is acceptable as an aqidah or uh, as an article of faith for the members of this faith? And uh, and is this the correct way of determining or not? Okay. Okay, so we find in Judaism, basically, that they have a system uh, whereby uh, the rabbis have uh, gotten together and uh, they got together around the same time uh, around the, the, the same time period that the Bible was compiled, okay. uh, the Jews also, they finalized the final compilation of what books they were going to put into the uh, Torah or the Old Testament. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, we know that the Old Testament consists of uh, the the Pentateuch or the uh, five first books of Moses, right? Yes. Which is Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Exodus, and Numbers. Yes. And uh, But there's also other books that are in the Old Testament. Yeah. Like what? Um, there's many. There's the books of the prophets. There's the books of the major prophets, the books of the minor prophets. There's the poetic writings. Um, and there's the more historical writings. So... Uh, the I think the it's referred to as the Tanakh in the according to the Jewish faith uh, or the Hebrew Bible. Uh, all of these categories are um, put together in the. Okay, in the so in simple terms for our viewer, what's going on here? What's going on is that you had the rabbis; they're sitting around, okay, and um, they have all of these books. All of these manuscripts, all of these scrolls that are lying around, mm -hmm. um, they have the most important of them, which is these the these Pentateuch. these first five books that were written by Moses, yes, right, uh, which he says was from Genesis to Exodus, mm -hmm. and and in that Moses uh, details out the entire history of humanity from Adam and Eve mm -hmm. all the way down to uh, the events that took mm -hmm. place in his life, right, yeah. And and then you have in in that in that history you have the mentioning of all of these uh, prophets and messengers that the Israelites believed in. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have you had manuscripts of those messengers that were found individually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So you might have, for example, the songs of Solomon. Yes. Right. Uh, you would have the Psalms of David. Mm -hmm. uh, you you would have the Book of Jonah or, or yeah. Zechariah, right? Yes. And and so the Jews they got together, the rabbis, and they begin to look at all these different texts, and they thought to themselves, "Okay, we believe these to be authentic. What do you guys think?" They were in consensus about the fact that this book. Uh, went along with the Torah and there was nothing in it that contradicted the Torah and they gave certain books their stamp of approval and they accepted it and they compiled it and then they said guys this is the final um, uh, the, 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 the final uh, Old Testament and every Jew must believe in it okay All right yeah but there were other books there are many other books that they had to 
uh, you know, because it wasn't every book that they accepted. Yeah, that's true. There were true. many books that they rejected. So these are like the apocryphal writings? And yeah. Things that are, yeah. So there were books that they considered to be not as important as the ones because it couldn't be an everlasting book or, or a non-ending book, the never-ending, it can't be the never-ending story. Yeah. So there has to be a beginning and end to it. So they decided, okay, well, we do still have these other writings uh, from other prophets, um, but we're, we don't think it's that important to put in, or we doubt the authenticity of it. Okay. And we're not sure um, that it is authentic. It might have some things that's a little bit controversial, so we don't want to add it in there. And examples of this is the uh, uh, the book of uh, Zerubbabel, right? Mm. And we also have the book of Enoch, for yeah, example. Book of Enoch is and, and what's interesting is that there are uh, there are other religions, other denominations. Uh, for example, there are Ethiopian Christians and Jews that have in their Old Testament and their Torah, uh, the book of Enoch is included okay. in it. Okay. 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 That's interesting. So you have slight differences. Yeah. yeah. So now we have different copies of the Old Testament, different copies of the Torah existing on the planet okay. uh, that contain different manuscripts in it. Okay, for the most part, they're the same, but there are um, differences. Okay, so so then so then I think it becomes a thing where where people, um, you know, becomes less important for them. They begin to tend to disregard books that were not included in the Torah, and they say, well, if it was authentic, if it was important, then the rabbis would have known these people. Um, You know, they studied all their life. They would have put it in there if it was important, and then they just disregard it. And that becomes a really dangerous thing because then uh, the only source of information that they have is just what these people that lived uh, hundreds, if not thousands of years before them determined um, that their faith would consist of, like only within this realm or this circle, this scope. Yeah. I mean, that's very limiting. And then you have to question the judgment of those people if they were, you know, able to actually decide whether this was worth reading or um, authenticating or not. And, um, you know, I don't know whether those people. Um, there, there are new books that are actually discovered uh, all the time, right, throughout history, mm-hmm. even recently um, in the past century or so. So, um, yeah, it, it definitely calls into question whether we're getting the whole story Okay, so so they have that, and and then they have other sources though of information or sources of information for their followers, right? Yeah. Uh, one of them is the midrash, for yeah. example, their collection of hadiths. It's like the Jewish Sahih yeah. Bukhari, yeah, right, where they have in it uh, all of the like interpretations. No, no, not not really interpretations, but so much as as the the um, stories, uh, like oral traditions that have been passed on. Uh, from rabbi to rabbi that, that explain more the stories, but they're not really like the personal interpretation of okay. the Jews so much as it is like stories, uh, of Jacob and, and Isaac and Moses and Noah that, uh, so it's hadith. It's just uh, stories of the prophets and the messengers that just didn't make it into, uh, the Torah or weren't part of the, of the Torah. Okay. 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 And then they have the third source of information, which is the rabbis themselves. Okay, okay. so in Judaism, uh, uh, the rabbis, the role of the rabbi is very important. Um, and it's uh, they consider them to be basically uh, similar to the way that Islam considers to be uh, considers these scholars. Mm-hmm. They consider to be uh, they're considered to be the inheritors of the prophets and the messengers and the guardians of the of the faith. And uh, this is their realm. And uh, so uh, the the common understanding that Jews have is that God. God would uh, inspire uh, rabbis, certain rabbis that have reached uh, degrees of closeness and, and higher uh, realms of understanding. God can inspire them with the correct understanding of the Torah or bring down his Shekinah, uh, Shekinah upon them and, and help enlighten them. So sometimes their words also um, ends up becoming a, a, an article of faith or their interpretation or their understanding ends up being an article of faith that helps shape 
okay. uh, the belief system of the Jewish people. Okay, I mean that sounds a bit dangerous. The the words of a man who you know may is not exactly appointed by God uh, can actually shape and play a role in the yeah religion. it is so so basically the the beliefs now that the jews have is a combination between uh, those words that are considered to be the infallible words of infallible prophets and messengers and the fallible understandings of uh you know human beings that are scholars or rabbis okay now we go over to uh islam and we're going to skip over Christianity and come back to it in the end, sure. uh, because Islam is very similar to Judaism in this regard. They have, first of all, Quran, and the Quran is the infallible word, word of God, yes. just like the Torah is. And uh, the Quran, they believe that no changes has ever happened to it, and this is their primary source, uh, just like the Torah is their primary source for uh, the stories of the prophets and the messengers and for the jurisprudence and beliefs. Okay. And this is what uh, all Muslims draw their, their faith from in the, in the number one uh, degree. They also have, after that, a hadith. Yes. Just like the Jews have Midrash, they have Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Bahar al-Anwar, all of these uh, texts, whether you're a Sunni or Shia, that has in there the narrations yeah. Uh, of the people. For Sunnis, Sunni Islam, they take the narrations of that first generation of people, first generation or two of people that lived and saw the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so all of them. So, yeah, so, so pretty much all of them and they also developed a system whereby they could eliminate the narrations of the people that they considered to be heretics or or known liars or anybody that had a, a bad reputation in anything, they would eliminate him. So anything that he said that he heard the prophet say, they wouldn't take by uh, his narration. And this okay. is a science which uh, which is called Ilm al-Rijal, or the, the science of knowing men. And, and so they study the bi- biographies of the companions of the prophet and in Shia Islam is the same thing is going on where they where they study the the biographies of the companions of the imams right and anybody who they consider to be an extremist or somebody who was uh, known to embellish in stories or somebody whose credibility just wasn't uh, in the opinion of the scholars like so so good um, or somebody who was attacked in the narration. So if you have somebody who was living in that time period that said that uh, person X, uh, you know, was bad or he was known to lie, then automatically person X now is no more uh, reliable as a source of transmission of narrations. Okay, that's, I mean, that sounds odd to me that you have two, two fallible uh, human beings like one fallible human being deciding whether another fallible human being is a reliable source. It's very yeah. They consider it to be like background checks. Yeah, uh, that's okay. what we call Amir Rijal. It's like it's like the background checks of the of the uh, of the companions, and then they determine uh, who it is that they want to believe in. And, and then now the belief system of Muslims are determined by the Quran, and then the stories of how the Prophet explained the Quran and how the Prophet was or or how the Imams were, but only through the lenses uh, and the narrations of this particular group of companions that were chosen by a group of scholars that lived uh, hundreds of years ago. Okay. And it's just been passed down. And it's just been passed down. Okay. 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 All right. So the same thing that's going on with Judaism for the most part is the same thing that's going on uh, with Islam, except that they're more advanced in this knowledge of the, uh, of the, uh, of the men who were transmitters of the narration uh, obviously, uh, the times of Moses and the times of the prophets and the messengers were thousands of years uh, before uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So there's a lot more difficulty in tracking down uh, the reliability of the narrators versus over here. Um, you know, they know that so and so, son of so and so, son of so and so, he said that he saw the prophet, and they, you know, and this is what he said. Okay. Then you have. Uh, last, lastly, is the is the words of the scholars. 
And so in addition to the Quran and to the narrations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi um, is now the opinion of scholars, and 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 this is very necessary in Islam, and and you find it uh, very widespread, and in Shia Islam. Uh, it's so extremely important to to have uh, a scholar that you follow and you believe him in in his interpretations and his outlooks on on things. Yeah. Um, that uh, they even say that um, if you if you're not doing taqlid or imitation of a particular scholar. Uh, to shape your worldview on on religion, and then your prayer is not accepted, and your fasting is not accepted, oh. and and none of it's accepted because uh, the scholars are pretty much like the doorway to Imam Mahdi, and they give them great titles like Hajjat al Islam, the proof of all of Islam, or they call them uh, Ayatullah al Uzma, the greatest. A sign of God. Uh, these are titles that they give to uh, their scholars. So obviously, wow. uh, they revere their yeah. scholars to to a high degree, and uh, and uh, the scholars definitely in Shia Islam shape uh, the opinions of the Shia and most of the Shia. Uh, just like in Judaism and Christianity, really, uh, they don't read for themselves and they don't research for themselves. They just when they have a, a, a question, they'll just go. Ask the scholar, and the scholar answers, and that suffices. Okay. Okay. It's a, I mean, it sounds like they really put them in a high place. No, they, they do. They're highly esteemed. And, um, I, I mean, it makes me wonder why, uh, why they place them in such a high place. But, uh, yeah, they, they clearly do shape the religion. I know, uh, like, because we live in a different time than the Prophet Muhammad lived in. People have questions about the modern time that we live in, and uh, there are questions that the Prophet Muhammad never answered. So their belief, uh, it, it's it's in line with uh, the fact that you need an imam. You, you need an imam in every time uh, to guide the religion. So they're the ones actually shaping the religion now in that role of the imam of the time. Yes. So, and then Sunni Islam is the same thing, and they have these, uh, you know, uh, uh, big time Sunni scholars like Ibn Baz or, uh, you know, uh, the, um, you know, and, and these scholars that they name their major schools of thought after, like the Malki school of thought or Hanbali or Hanafi. Um, a school of, of thoughts, they name them after these scholars because um, all the followers uh, uh, of this particular sect of Islam or school of thought of Islam, uh, they accept all the opinions of that particular scholar. Okay. Uh, in terms of the jurisprudence and also in terms of their overall uh, outlook and understanding of the, of the faith. Okay. okay. Interesting. Now we come to Christianity. Okay. okay, why don't you tell us a little bit about the sources. We talked Judaism, Islam. They have three sources each. What about Christianity, Catholicism, and Protestants? Okay, uh, well, obviously, we have the Bible. Uh, the Bible is the one that Catholics and Protestants agree on. They they take the Bible as the holy book. Uh, they we uh, We've spoken about... Uh, that they believe that the Holy Spirit was, you know, involved in the process of the compilation of the Bible. And, uh, and so they take it as this infallible, in a sense, book. Um, and the Protestants, they believe that actually the Bible, uh, is enough. This concept of sola scriptura, the Bible alone is enough. And they have the Holy Spirit with them individually. So, the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the Bible is enough for them. The Catholics, uh, they, they follow a Pope. Um, they, it's going back to the appointment of Simon Peter, which is in the Bible, where Jesus appoints Simon Peter as his successor. So the Pope that we have today is seen as the most recent in this long chain of successors going all the way back to Simon Peter. Um, and the Pope is seen as the source, uh, much like you're describing the, the rabbis or the, the scholars in Islam, the Pope for the Catholics is the one who, who has this infallibility, this papal infallibility when he's speaking from the throne 
to uh, to make judgments on. But he's not just like a normal scholar, right? No, so no, he's seen as he's, he's seen he's as the, the keeper of, the of yes, exactly. He's seen as the the, the one overseeing the kingdom the of Christ. Of Yes, exactly. He's the imam of the time, essentially. So, uh, for example, people ask the Pope about modern things happening, and, and then he makes statements about it. So, um, just one example off the top of my head, uh, he was, you know, asked a few years ago about homosexuality, and then he made a new statement on that, uh, more in keeping with modern times. So, this is just one example. Uh, he's asked about things, and then he gives a ruling. So, he is very much the one shaping uh, the the thought and the the religion uh, for Catholics, and because it was actually not until uh, later in history that there was this schism where Protestants broke off from Catholics. Uh, actually, the popes throughout history shaped a lot of uh, Christianity. Yeah, they shaped a lot of the religion throughout time. So. Yeah, okay. those are the main sources, just the Bible, and for the Catholics, also the Pope. So, uh, out of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, because Shia Islam is like Catholicism, uh, Protestant uh, Christianity is like uh, Sunni Islam. Yeah, um, but we don't have Hadith. Shia Islam, they have a Hajja, the Imam of the Zaman, or they have a Pope, and that's Imam al-Mahdi, but for the Twelver Shias, uh, he's in an occultation. So really, uh, the scholars step up and they take control. Uh, but over here, because of the presence of the Pope, so he's the source of information for the Catholics, yes. but it's unlike those others. So for Catholicism, it's the Bible, number one. Two, it is the Pope, yeah. right? And then three, there is, is there another three? I mean, you have like your, your like you have your priests, you have like a, a lower down source, uh, you know, the Pope is obviously the the one who is the Imam of the time, but then the priest is more is the one at your local uh, church. So, okay. uh, do, some, do Christians, Protestants, and Catholics do they have like a a book of hadiths or narrations like uh, like the Midrash or like Sahih Bukhari or Baha'u'llah? No, not not really. No. So I their mean, only source of stories about Jesus is only from the New Testament. That's all that they take. Yes, because. Um, Reading other things which are not considered uh, officially authentic according to the church is actually very much discouraged. Okay, so that's interesting. So, so because the Protestants broke off from the Catholics, it means that in the very beginning it was only Catholics. And in the very beginning, right? In, in, uh, in Europe, yeah. In, in Europe, Europe yeah. in the very beginning, yeah. it was the Catholic Church, right? Or the, the, the Roman, Catholic, yeah. Roman Catholic Church that chose and determined uh, what books are going to go into the New Testament. And they compiled it at the Council of Nicaea back at the, uh, uh, around the same time that the Torah was compiled. Mm -hmm. They're having their own compilation of, yeah. of texts yeah. and, and they decide they have a vote or yeah. they gather all of the Christian priests from all over the world yeah. and they sit at a table and they say, Okay, we got this text and this text and this text and this gospel and that gospel and this gospel. Let's vote on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one of the aspects of uh, the history, which I mean, is is not necessarily widely taught. The history of the Bible is a lot less. Um, it's a lot less. It's not how I would have thought it was, you know, growing up, I considered the Bible to be this infallible text. And I never thought about how it was actually put together uh, under sort of political pressure. Um, uh, this happened in the fourth century uh, in Rome. And it, w it was uh, in, the middle, in the midst of this very big political move where the Roman Empire had just adopted Christianity as the, the state faith. Uh, they had been persecuting Christians. Obviously, we know about the Circus of Nero and the great persecution that happened with the Christians in the early centuries. And then uh, at some point it switched and the emperor just decided, let's just make it the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire, and then they had these councils, like you, like the Council of Nicaea, like you said, this series of councils uh, where they decided many, many things based on a vote of the people. Um, yeah, yeah, they gathered uh, different people to sit at the table. They found that there were Christians that were teaching that Jesus was a prophet. Yeah, uh, there were. Christians that were teaching um, a variety of crazy beliefs about yeah. Jesus, and they didn't know which ones to take. And obviously, the whole council came to be, like you said, because 
of the fact that there was a Roman emperor who uh, there there he was having a power struggle against uh, you know uh, against his own people yeah. and basically to win uh, in the war that he was in he claims that he has this dream where his soldiers are gaining victory because they're carrying uh, banners and shields that have the X on there and uh, the X it looks like the cross and so therefore it's a sign from him that Jesus um, you know is with him and that he should adopt Christianity so that's what he does all the mm -hmm. Christians they fight for uh, this Roman Catholic uh, this Roman emperor yeah. uh, who ends up basically establishing the the church and uh, and that's uh, that's how it happened yeah so they determined they chose this this pagan Gentile inheritor of the throne of the oppressors of the Jews and the Christians, he ends up being the one who determines for all Christians for all time uh, what is in the Bible and what's not yeah, in the Bible. And many historians say that he never even became a Christian, really. It wasn't... It was all a scam. It was political. Yeah. And that's that's very strange for me. Um and and that's the that's the political that's the the climate in which the Bible was compiled. Mm -hmm. And it was him who was calling together all of these priests from all over the world, all these bishops from all over the world. And um yeah, I I I find that story quite alarming because it's not widely taught to Christians that this is the history mm -hmm. of this book. Okay, so now we've mentioned all this, and not, and and I think you know my favorite one out of all of them is the uh, the source of information that the Protestant Christians have, uh, where they believe that they're all just uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, and uh, that becomes like their feelings become a guidance for them, uh, even if all of their feelings are in contradiction with each other, yeah. uh, and and yeah, so are these methods of determining the truth or limiting the information that Jews and Christians and Muslims have about their own faith. Uh, is this correct? Is this right? Would the prophets and messengers, I guess that's the next question, would the prophets and messengers have approved of the the knowledge of, of men or that we follow the scholars and take their opinions or do taqlid of them or just follow our own uh, uh, feelings on things because we believe that the Holy Spirit is uh, enforcing us like, and, and we just stick to these particular texts that the people have given us. Is this uh, the correct way? And I think that uh, what we find when we go back to the Quran itself or the Torah or the, the, the Bible, we go back to the words of the prophets and the messengers, we'll find that one the Quran says that if you follow most of those people that are on earth, then you would be, uh, you would go astray. Uh, they would lead you astray. Okay. okay. So following the majority is always the wrong thing to do. It is not where the truth is. And this is the word of God. And in terms of Jesus, Jesus said that when you find the truth, you'll be disturbed. Yeah. All right. So the truth has to be disturbing. Yeah. If the truth uh, if it tastes like honey, then it's probably not the truth. Okay. This is what Jesus' yeah, okay. words mean, right? Yeah, yeah. So then who's going to decide, you know, who's going to who's going to know what what Well, the Ahl al they also said they said that verily most of the truth is found in that which the people deny. Okay, and that's a very important hadith, because what that means is is that that most of what the people accept is not truth. Oh my gosh! But most of what the people deny actually is the truth. If you want to know the truth, then leave what the people are reading, go find all those things that the people rejected, and you will find over there the truth. Just like Jesus, what does he describe himself as? as? The cornerstone? Yeah, that the people rejected, yes. Exactly. Yes. And in him was the truth, right? Yes. So the truth is always in what the people uh, reject. And the 
as in Beit HaNem in many narrations, uh, this, this reality comes to light. Uh, for example, um, there's a narration where they go to one of the Imams, Alayhi Wasallam, and they, they ask him blankly, directly. They say, sometimes we get these, these narrations, uh, from you. Like we hear somebody say that they heard you say XYZ. And it's something that is strange to us. And we don't know how to deal with this. And the Imams have stated in more than one narration that the correct action is to automatically accept it. Okay. Don't deny anything that you hear narrated from us, lest you deny the truth and you be considered of those who disbelieved. Wow. Okay. Okay. You have to be extremely open-minded. Extremely yeah. open-minded. So now the default setting for the believer should be what? It should be that you look for the truth in, in places that other people are rejecting. And on top of that, any truth that you stumble across, any narration, any hadith, anything, you, you automatically be in the state of at least not denying it. You know, and you should, you should accept it, even if you don't understand it, even if it's apparent is contradictory to, uh, the Quran or the Sunnah of what you know, you have to at least say, well, I don't understand how it is the case, but perhaps there's an explanation behind it. Okay. And the person who does this will end up being guided according to, um, the traditions and the narrations. And it makes sense because yeah. why would we, um, you know, allow ourselves to be limited in the sources of information that's out there about our prophets and our messengers. Yeah. And now when we ask the question, okay, well, if, if we're going to go by this mentality and try to look into those things which the people rejected, you know, why is it that these other Gospels or these other books were not included into the Gospels? Why was it that these... These rabbis, these priests, this emperor, these uh, Sunni scholars, these Shia scholars, why did they consider these hadiths or these sources to be to be not authentic or they just didn't want to add it or teach it to us? And you will find that all of these sources have in their extremely controversial ideas and sayings of the prophets and the messengers. And many of the texts or manuscripts or gospels are called the secret gospel yeah. of so-and-so. So they were, they were sayings of Jesus or sayings of the prophets that were not intended to be for the masses, but were given to the closest of companions or the people with the strongest faith. Yeah. So we're going to go over some of the ideas as headlines okay. uh, for some of these things that are found in these texts, because we're going to be going in depth into many of them in future episodes, okay. right? And seeing uh, if we can't figure out together uh, what is the truth, right? Okay. Um, one of them is this idea that Jesus had a favorite disciple and his favorite disciple was Mary Magdalene. And the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene was something more than just a teacher disciple relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know of this. There's Gnostic Gospels, uh, like from the Nag Hammadi Library, for example, like the Gospel of Philip, where it's mentioned that he he loved Mary the most and that he used to kiss her often on the mouth. Wow. Like, so there we have a reason now. Now we have a different type of Jesus yeah. and a different picture of Jesus that's emerging. Yeah. A Jesus that was not abstinent. Yeah. A Jesus that had... Uh, a a companion, wife potentially yeah. or a she's companion. she's referred to as his companion too as well in these gospels which is it's very interesting very different Jesus very different portrayal of Jesus and we also have narrations that that we mentioned in the goal of the wise and we're not going to get into it too much right now but but a a an incident where Jesus was actually uh, in a full blown 
a relationship with a woman whom he created. Mm. And this took okay. place in, in, in front of Mary Magdalene as well. So now you have a Jesus that, that uh, is in relationships with women, uh, a Jesus that is in a relationship with Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. Um, you have in there other ideas. There's also a gospel that states um, that the people were confused in regards to the virgin birth. Mm. And that actually um, the Holy Spirit is a female and that there is no female that can impregnate another female. And that the people who claimed this idea that Mary was a virgin, they were mistaken. Mm. Okay? Wow. And that it actually means something else. And that if Jesus didn't have an earthly father, the manuscript says, then he wouldn't have said, my father who is in heaven. Okay? So, uh, shattering the idea that there is a virgin birth, this is also... Uh, an idea that exists, um, and there, you know, in 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 some of those gospels that were not in the um, in okay. the Bible, and that matches yeah. also what many of the Jewish rabbis say in regards to the virgin birth. Yeah, uh, that the word that's translated to mean virgin actually in Hebrew it doesn't mean virgin at all. Yeah, it means. Uh... Like I mean, young young woman. It means like a yeah. young woman instead of a, a virgin woman. Like they're not expecting that the Messiah comes from a from a virgin birth. Exactly. Well, so, that, I mean, I, I can understand that they saw these teachings and they immediately said, "No, no, it's impossible." Based on their own understanding of what Jesus could have taught or what Jesus could have said, but I mean, some of the other manuscripts, uh, Jesus claims that Moses was confused uh, when writing the Old Testament and he made many mistakes in the interpretation or the transmission of the stories that are present in Genesis. Uh, for example, he claims that Moses made a mistake in, in regards to um, the story of the ark and that it really wasn't an ark like that that no one his companions went into, but rather they went into a cloud. Or he states that uh, the the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, that this was also uh, a mistake that was made on Moses' behalf. And uh, uh, he even claims at one point in one of these Gospels, Jesus claims to be the serpent or to be the, the one who caused Adam to eat from the tree. So you have these very uh, seemingly heretical ideas that are existing in the Gospels that probably scared a lot of the priests and uh, they condemned uh, these Gospels and, and wanted nothing to do with it. And there was lots of other Gospels, by the way, that are no longer in existence yeah. that they burnt and yeah. destroyed. I was going to say, they they did something which is a little suspicious, which is they didn't, they didn't just say, we don't take these Gospels, but they actually really tried to destroy them and they almost did. Mm-hmm. Many of them, they, they were lost for many, many centuries. And they, it was just almost a miraculous discovery of some copies of them just in the past century. So, I mean, they wanted to completely kill these concepts. They wanted to completely do away with those ideas. But they did survive. And we, and we do know about them now. And, I mean, I, I see that they're extremely controversial. They're extremely controversial for Christians and for Jews. Because yes. this means that the Old Testament, the Torah, like, it calls into question what we know, the whole traditional story, and that's a big deal. It is a big deal. And you also have, um, you have in there, uh, for example, uh, manuscripts where Jesus is literally calling all of the prophets and the messengers of the Old Testament uh, laughingstock. Yeah, and I know this one. Yeah. You know this one? Yeah, he just lists them. He says, that he, he lists them. He says, uh, you know, he says Adam was a laughingstock uh, and then goes down the list of many of the prophets and lists uh, mistakes and reasons why they were just imperfect and, and therefore they were laughing stocks. They didn't understand God, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's manuscripts that claim that Jesus wasn't crucified and we went over yeah. uh, some of those ideas. It's like all of the central tenets of the faith it might be wrong. Yeah, or, or misunderstood. Or misunderstood, yeah. But Jesus, 
even in the gospels that we have was very clear that he liked to confuse people and he liked to speak in in a very uh he liked to speak in parables so that people who didn't have understanding would continue to be confused it was like he was safeguarding the knowledge yeah, he, he made it clear that he had a lot of secrets and he really didn't share them with most people so and then you had uh, you you have this idea also that appears in many of the gnostic manuscripts that there are uh two gods and not one uh, one that's a lesser god and yeah. then there's one that's the ultimate god the, the la ilaha illallah or the huwa the ultimate god uh, the father uh, so to speak and then you have this lesser god who's 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 actually an angel who's actually the devil yeah. and he has many names in these gospels yeah. like uh, Samael or or uh, huh? the Beos, right? yes yeah. exactly and um, that he is the one who's responsible for the creation of the world and that actually he's the one who uh, sent forward uh, the prophets and the messengers of the Old Testament. Wow. I mean, That's the, it's extremely heavy. It's extremely controversial. It requires a lot of thought and study. Yeah. But but Jesus also did say that when you look for the truth, you'll find the truth and it will disturb you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what was he talking about? Yeah, and, they, and, and I think it becomes obligatory upon every believer who's hearing these ideas um, to remember the words of the Ahl Bayt and the Prophets and the Messengers and, and ask themselves, uh, should I look into these claims or should I immediately dismiss them? And I think that the moment that we just begin to look into these ideas, we find that there are more and more supporting evidence for these ideas in the very books that are between our hands. For example, this idea that now uh, it is the devil who is uh, the one who created creation, the physical creation, and it's the devil who's in charge of the world. Uh, we find that in the temptation of Jesus, yeah. uh, the devil at one point is telling Jesus, I'm in charge of the entire world. I can make you king over all of the world if you just fall down and prostrate and worship me. That is so true. So there's the devil How can you in offer the something? position of a god, yeah. right? Saying, I already own all of this. I'm the one who makes kings. I can, I created all, the, please just get down and worship me and I will make you king of, of all of this. And obviously, uh, Jesus refuses to do so. Wow. So, so the notion then, uh, that these manuscripts that were outside of the Bible might be containing a, a lot of truth is not a far-fetched idea, and we must examine them uh, with an open mind and with logic and not with emotions. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's, very, it's impossible, actually, to examine them if you're emotional or attached to certain ideas. You will never be able to, to have an open mind uh, and to actually... Uh, objectively uh, compare that some concepts that are here are also present in the Bible that's between your hands. So. Well, I think also that like if, if we were if we were people that wouldn't uh, be open to exploring um, new ideas, uh, if we weren't like the imams told us that we should be, uh, we are the companions of the evidence. Uh, whichever way the evidence goes, we go. All right. Uh, if we weren't like that, then we would, our likeness would be like the likeness of those Jews that were living in the time of Jesus that rejected him. And they didn't even have enough of an open mind to even be able to begin to uh, uh, explore the possibility that he might really be from God. Right. That is absolutely so true, because in his time, he he appeared to be heretical. He appeared to be going against the tradition. And that was one of those accusations that was always thrown at him. Mm -hmm. And he was saying things that were expanding the minds. They were expanding the understanding. And yeah, exactly. We don't want to be like those people. We don't want no, to be don't. the people who rejected the Messiah. Like, absolutely not. So over the course of this uh, coming period, Tiffany, what we're going to do is we're going to touch upon 
in uh, in our episodes uh, the, of the School of Divine Mysteries. Uh, a lot of these ideas, uh, we're going to explore these hadiths, um, these narrations, these gospels, these manuscripts that are giving us larger pieces of the puzzle. And we're going to see if those pieces fit into uh, the pieces of the puzzle that we already have. Okay. And we're going to see whether or not this is going to lead us on a mystical, magical journey uh, towards the truth. I, I can't wait. Thank you so much for everything that we've talked about today. It's really-